This is the fourth and last of the four talks I put together about the houses of West Buckland School. This one is the Grenville. The Grenville is, so far as I can make out, the only house of the four which has a birth certificate. It appears on page 69 of the school magazine for November 1918. The magazine, by the way, was called the Register then. It began in 1863 and continued until it was reorganized, enlarged and renamed in 1998. Well, the Grenville and the Register. On page 69, November 1918, it said, a new house has come into existence. That's it. No reason, no explanation, no account of how. A new house has come into existence. Just like that, <laughs> a sort of big bang, or if you are a member of the other three houses, a little bang. So I thought, how did it come about? There must have been some discussion somewhere at a pretty high level. What about the minutes of the governor's meetings? I looked them up. In the whole of 1918, how many governor's meetings were there? One, on the 5th of July. Well, only one recorded. Perhaps the fact that there was a war on had something to do with it. Anyway, what was in the minutes? A list of those who attended, naturally. One of them, incredibly, was the Reverend Joseph Thompson. Why incredibly? Because he was the first headmaster, appointed in 1858, now retired, of course. But he was still alive in 1918, 60 years later. Then there was some stuff about the numbers of pupils. The total was now 137. In his report to the governors, the headmaster, Harry's, said that he had raised them from about 80 in 1907. Not bad going. He gave details of the numbers of ex-pupils serving in the army. About 300, apparently. Two had won the DSO. Twelve had got the MC. But he said nothing about creating a new house. There was a bit about the water supply. Apparently, the water difficulty still existed, whatever that was. No set of governor's meetings in those days, no set of governor's minutes was complete without a reference to, to drains or water or sewage or wells or septic tanks or cesspits. Apart from that, and a couple of votes of thanks and a wedding present for the headmaster, he was getting married at 50. That was about it. So what happened? It looks as if Harry, as the head, sat down one day and said to himself, 137 pupils, that's too many for three houses, we ought to start a fourth. So he did. And there it is, in the register. I think he was the editor as well, so he could put in what he liked. We have over 600 pupils today, and nobody has suggested creating a fifth house. Interesting. The actual choice of the name Granville was not a surprise. Granville was a famous Devon name. There were several Granvilles who got themselves into the history books, but the most famous, and obviously the one Harry's had in mind, was Sir Richard Granville, one of Queen Elizabeth I's gang of sea dogs. What were the sea dogs? They were the sea captains who made life miserable for the Spanish during the second half of the 16th century. Raiding, pirating, illegal trading, capturing treasure ships, and generally being a pain in the neck for the best part of 30 years. And don't think they were true blue Boy Scout heroes just because they were English. Oh no. For the most part, they were ambitious, arrogant, ruthless, ornery, cussed individualists who were offered as much embarrassment to the Queen as they were to the Spanish. And it is possible to make a case that Grenville was the most ambitious, arrogant, ruthless, ornery and cussed of the lot. Just to show you, in 1591, he and his Admiral Howard ran into an enormous squadron of Spanish warships sent to guard another treasure fleet, which uh, was coming back from the Indies, loaded to the gunnels with gold and silver. Howard decided that 
they'd gone out there to ambush it, but Harold, uh, Howard took one look at the size of the Spanish fleet, 53 ships, and decided that it was wise to order a retreat. He was outnumbered over four to one. Grenville had fallen behind because he'd been getting some sick shavers. <laughs> sick sailors. I'll get it right in a minute. He'd been getting some sick sailors off a nearby shore. And he found the Spanish fleet in his way. He disobeyed orders to go the long way round and avoid trouble because he thought he could slip in between the two halves of the Spanish fleet. Well, it turned out that he couldn't. Hemmed in on all sides, grappled to a standstill, he fought off the entire Spanish fleet for 15 hours. His ship, the Revenge, sank two enemy ships, disabled two more, and caused hundreds of casualties. Severely wounded himself, he decided to blow up his ship rather than surrender. But for once he did not get his own way. His sailors, only about 25, remained on their feet, had him transferred under a flag of truce to a Spanish ship, where he sadly died three days later. The revenge, what was left of her, was wrecked in a storm two or three days after that. Honour and glory may be, immortality even, but he could have saved his ship and saved his men if he had done as he was told. And if he had, would Grenville House be here now? What do you think? Was it worth it? <laughs>